Was she screaming? No, but she should have been. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host. This week, I want to talk about the case of Yearly Reynolds' love. Yearly was born on July 17, 1987, in Baltimore, Maryland. She attended Notre Dame Preparatory School and was a member of the varsity lacrosse and the field hockey teams for all four years that she was there. She was accepted at the University of Virginia, where she majored in government and minored in Spanish. She had a very busy social life between academics, sports, and friends. She had an apartment that she shared with another girl, which was located in the University Corner District. This was in Charlottesville. Yardley also had an on-again, off-again boyfriend, George Wesley Hughley V. He was born September 17, 1987, in Washington, D.C. He attended Landon, which was an all-boys school. There, he was an All-American lacrosse player, and he also played football. He seemed very driven, charming, and his family came from a lot of money. Because of his love for sports, he went to the University of Virginia on a full scholarship. He majored in anthropology. They met while they were there at the university. Their apartments were not that far. He lived in the University Corner District, too. And because they both played lacrosse, they ran in the same circles. They were just days away from graduating with their degrees. The light was at the end of the tunnel. May 3rd of 2010 was a busy day for Yearly. She started the day off hanging out with friends at a local bar before she had to head to a birthday party. Towards the end of the night, her friends were still going strong, and they tried to get her to come and meet back up with them. But she was tired, and she just wanted to go home. When her roommate came home around 2 a.m., she had a male classmate with her. So they decided to go wake her up. They want to hang out for a little bit. As the roommate went down the hall to get to her room, she noticed that her door had a hole in it. She wasn't really sure what happened there, but she entered the room. She went over and she tried to wake her up by shaking her, but she wouldn't respond. When she tried to flip her body over, that's when she could see blood on a pillow. She hurried up and she called 911. When she called 911, she actually reported it as an alcohol overdose. But when police arrived on the scene, they saw that there was way more to this than just an alcohol overdose. Yardley had visible injuries to her head, including her face. The blood appeared to be coming somewhere between either her nose or her lip. It wasn't a whole lot of blood, anything to be like overly concerning about, but clearly there, there's blood. Where's it coming from? When police questioned her roommate and her friend, her roommate did note the front door was unlocked. They tell police about her on-again, off-again boyfriend, George, which at the time, they were off. Turns out that both of them got in a fight just the night before over at the bar. Their relationship was classified for being volatile. There was a lot of jealousy a lot of drinking, and a lot of back and forth. George especially was starting to kind of lose it with the alcohol. He had been in trouble with the law at least two times already by this point. He was busted down in Florida. His parents have a vacation home, and he was caught being underaged. The second one was in Lexington, Maryland, where he totally berated a female cop, Rebecca Moss. I watched Crime Lies in video, and she said that he called her such names and even sexual names that she wouldn't even repeat them on camera. But she did say that she had to tase them. All this heightens their suspicions. So about 7.45 in the morning, they pay George a visit. They're curious what they might find there. When he answered the door, his place was trashed. There's beer cans and just crap everywhere. It was a true college frat house. They told him that they were there to speak with him about an assault, and they wanted him to come down to the station. He willingly went back, 
He was very cooperative, but he still reeked of alcohol. His account of the day was that he went golfing with his dad. Some kind of golf event with him, his dad, and, you know, some buddies. He said the golf event ended about 5.30. They went to a restaurant to eat, but he was told to leave because I guess somebody caught him peeing out front of said restaurant. So his dad takes him home, and he tells police that his dad had some kind of paperwork that he wanted him to sign. He didn't really go much into it, just stating that he refused to sign it, and it really pissed him off. He just got out of his dad's car and went back into the house. When he got home, he needed more alcohol. So he was drinking, he's still got buddies there, but they run out of beer. You're not able to buy alcohol after midnight there. He stated that he decided he was going to go door to door. To the people he knew, of course. So he's knocking on doors, seeing if anybody wants to hang out. Does anybody have any beers? But unfortunately, the people that he picked, they were home, but they were studying. They weren't up for partying, drinking. I don't think they had any beers to give them. So he decides he's going to walk over to Yearly Rouse to see if she had any beer. And he really wanted to talk to her. When he got there, he went inside. Her door was open. But when he got to her bedroom door, that was locked. Lisa Best was the lead detective on the case. She noticed that he had some bruising on his knuckles. And there was a scrape on his arm. So she called him out. And she's like, did you beat her door down? And he's like, no. So they're like, okay, where did these injuries come from? I don't know. He said, I kicked in the door. See? And shows them the blood on his leg. The blood was actually on his knee. I don't, he kneed the door. I don't think I ever heard of that one before. He said he just wanted to talk to her. He told them that when he got inside, he went over to her bed, that she was in her bed and she was kind of like, not cower, I don't want to say cowering, but yeah, in the corner. I mean, I'm sure she's fucking frightened. I am sure this man just broke into your room and he just wants to talk to her. He states that she starts banging her head on her own bedroom wall and that he was telling her to stop. But she wouldn't stop. So he took her by the shoulders and he just shook her. In order to make her stop hurting herself, he said he wrestled her onto the floor to keep her still. And so he could talk to her. He said he never hit her. He never strangled her or struck her. When Detective Bess asked him, well, was she screaming? He said, no, but she should have been. He said that blood was coming from her nose or something because of her and that it might have got agitated or whatnot because he tossed her onto her bed after wrestling her on the floor. He wanted her to go to bed and get rest. So he picked her up, tossed her on the bed, and then left. He never went back and checked on her. He never gave it a second thought. He went home and went to bed. This man, I'm going to call him a man because he's in his 20s. You're, you're a man now. He had no clue that Yearly was dead. When Detective Best told him on Lies, Crimes, and Video, you can actually see the motions, the expression on his face. He was shocked. Literally, he was like, she's dead? And she's like, yes. She's dead. Yes. How the fuck is she dead? Told him because you killed her. He was in total disbelief. I'm not going to lie. It was kind of heartbreaking to watch. It's just kind of like a rare glimpse to watch a light bulb turn on to see what damage was really done. She was 22 years old. He was 22 years old. It's a lot to take in. He just kept repeating, she's not dead. She's not dead. He knew his life was done. He was arrested for first and second degree murder. 
I watched the show first before I started doing my other research, which I'll just say right now, thank you, Huffington Post and Wikipedia. I did just to watch somebody realize that they've just literally thrown their whole life away at such a young age. But then you get into the details of their full relationship. You get the whole picture. Clearly, there was a pattern in this relationship. They both were jealous of each other. Showed up to his house before with him having other females there. He would be jealous and always worried about who she was talking to, where she was at, and who she was with. Her mother had begged her to get a restraining order after he was found choking her at a party one night. But she wouldn't do it. After that, she did break up with him, but she wouldn't get the restraining order. George went to a guy's house that went on a date with Yeardley after, well, they were on a break. This guy woke up to George in his room, punching him while he was sleeping. He had big, black, swollen eyes. Four days before the murder, he sent her an email reading, A week ago, you said you would get back together with me if I stopped getting so drunk. And then you go and have sex with Burns. I should have killed you. She replied to him, you should have killed me? You're so fucked up. Mark Burns was another lacrosse player, but for the University of North Carolina. He was down visiting friends that were going to the University of Virginia. He would later testify in George's trial, stating that pretty much they were just hooking up. They hooked up a few times. The first time was in 2008. The last time was the week before she died. He said that he stayed with her at her apartment that night that George was choking her. It was in the middle of a party. It took a bunch of lacrosse players to make him stop. This party happened in February of 2010. And while she was having a party there, he could hear a girl's voice screaming, help me, help me. When he went into the room, he saw George lying on the bed with his arms around her neck. People at the golf course also ended up testifying at his trial, saying that George was visibly intoxicated. People would find him kind of like hanging by trees and just chugging beers. He had beers stuffed in his golf bag. His former teammate said that he had been drinking heavenly during the golf outing at the Wintergreen Resort and then again at dinner. That's when George switched from beer to wine. Some of his teammates were actually even discussing getting an intervention together. And you can't be a defense attorney if you don't turn the blame on the victim, right? His attorney, Fran Lawrence, said that that Yearly would have had more than enough power to take him on because of how inebriated he was. They said she was an athlete. She was in excellent condition. And her cause of death was truly from cardiopulmonary failure caused by Adderall and alcohol. After autopsy, they were able to put more of the pieces of the puzzle together. How did she die? What was the cause of death? Well, she died because of blunt force trauma to the head, but her brainstem also played a crucial part. When George left her place, she was still alive. She was disabled. When he was either shaken or... I, nobody will ever know what happened in that room but them two. But whatever he did to her, it snapped her brainstem. So she was still alive. She just wasn't able to help herself. The blood that was coming from her, her labia frontalum 
That's the thin layer of tissue that connects the lip to the gum and the bones in the face. His preliminary hearing for first-degree murder charge was held on April 11, 2011, in Charlottesville District Court. He was held without bond. On January 7, 2011, prosecutors added five additional charges. Felony murder, robbery of a residence, burglary, entering a house with an intent to commit a felony, and grand larceny. A grand jury indicted him on April 18, 2011 on first-degree murder and felony murder charges. Trial was set for February 6, 2012. After nine hours of deliberation, George was found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to 23 years. He will have to serve at least 80% of that at the Augusta Correctional Facility. On April 26, 2012, her mother, Sharon Love, she filed a wrongful death lawsuit against George, asking for $29.45 million in compensatory damages and $1 million in punitive damages. On May 1, 2012, she also filed lawsuits, which totaled $29.45 million. This one was a wrongful death lawsuit. This one went against the University of Virginia, the men's lacrosse head coach, Dom Starzia, associate head coach, Mark Van Arsdale, and the University of Virginia director of athletics, Craig Littlepage. She said they were negligent. It was well known to the players and the coaches on the University of Virginia men's and women's lacrosse team that George's alcohol abuse and erratic, aggressive behavior was increasingly getting out of control. And especially with his obsession with Yeardley and his aggressiveness and threats. But none of this mattered. No action was ever taken. They didn't discipline him. They didn't suspend him. They didn't remove him from the team. They didn't even refer him for treatment, for alcohol, substance abuse, or even to provide counseling. University of Virginia had a policy on preventing and addressing threats or acts of violence. They went against that. On September 29, 2010, Yeardley's family created Yeardley Reynolds Love Foundation also known as One Love. This is designed to help stop domestic abuse. There's even a scholarship awarded every year at the University of Virginia to a lacrosse player. For their first year, they get to use her locker, which was number one. If you would like to find out more about the foundation, please go to joinonelove.org. And that's all spelled out. Abuse is never okay. I truly believe that maybe if he would have gotten some kind of help, go to AA, counseling, something, this never would have happened. Sometimes people just don't know how to deal with things. Life can be a lot. I mean, there's work, there's school, children, families, car issues, past due bills home repairs. It never stops. But that's no excuse to overindulge to compensate. Everybody does it from time to time. Who am I to say? Crime over cocktails. I'm drinking right now. (laughs) Right now. The thing is, for people who have that need that they have to just keep going, keep going, keep going, it's because they're trying to put a band-aid on something, something deeper. Alcohol is not going to reach that wound. You'd need professional help or at least support, family support, friend support. If you need contacts for people who need substance abuse, alcohol abuse, anger issues, suicidal thoughts, it's all at crimeovercocktails.com. 
Now, I'm not saying that just because I want you to go, but I, I really want you to get the help that you need. And it's all right there. But, I mean, if you want to stick around, you know, there's other things you can do there, too. Like, listen to the episodes, check out the merch, or become a Patreon. Help support the show. I love what I do, but it's a lot of work. I'd like to give a real quick shout out to all of my patrons that I have right now and everybody who's helped me in other ways. I just want you guys to know how much that means to me. Really appreciate you guys. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. Especially when you subscribe, it'll let you know when the next episode is out. All right, you guys, we'll talk crime another time. Bye.